All right, turn to Matthew chapter 19. Chapter 19, Matthew 19. Here's another interesting title. Is being good, good enough? So let me ask you, is being good, good enough? And the answer is no. Why do I bring this up? I hear Christians all the time say, oh, I know this one person, just a wonderful guy or wonderful lady, and just does really neat things and really precious and really good. Surely she must be a Christian. And I, I have to tell these people, you're on the wrong track. Yes, there are good atheists out there. There are good agnostics out there who don't believe in God. They're very good people. I know a lot of them. But is that good enough to get you to heaven? And this is where they blow it. And they struggle with this. Because I'm sure all of you know friends that are unsaved. And they're very good people. And naturally in our minds, we want to say, oh, surely we're going to see this person in heaven. But they miss the major point, and it's called the Bible. You could be good, but you can end up in hell. You can be the nicest person in the world, but you can end up in hell. You can be all that have the wonderful attributes that pe many people have. And we struggle with that. We struggle with seeing people that are not have never accepted Christ. Oh, surely God's going to make an excuse. You know, exception to the rule for this person because they're so good. But see, God doesn't make exceptions to the rule. You see, when we say a person's good, we're comparing it to other people. And we're not comparing it to the holiness of God. Amen. So this is the scripture I want to talk about. You can be good enough to go to hell. You say, now wait a minute, pastor, aren't you carrying this to the extreme? I said, no, I'm not. And so we're going to go through the Bible. I want you to start with Matthew 19, follow along with me, 17 through 22. 17 through 22. A Pharisee, had, an individual came up, and listen, what we, we'll start back at verse 16. Now behold, one came and said unto him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which ones? Jesus said, Thy shalt not murder, thy shalt not commit adultery, thy shalt not steal, Thy shalt not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here's where the young man gave the wrong answer. The young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said unto him, If you want to be perfect, notice how he said that, if you want to be perfect, Go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heavens, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that, saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Lord be with the message today. He blew it. He was going by the commandments and not falling upon the mercy of Almighty God. Now, in the first verse, Jesus was trying to say two things when he said there's only one good, and that is God. He was trying to illustrate to the man that that's who that young man was addressing, that Jesus was God. So that was the point. But a second point, which most people miss, he says, why are you calling me good if you're looking at me as a, man, a prophet or a teacher, a man? There's only one good. 1 Peter 1, 16, other verses, makes it clear, be you holy for I am holy. See, when we compare ourselves to man, 
Well, sometimes we look pretty good. Sometimes we look pretty bad. But we have to compare ourselves to God. So when you think in terms of how we express ourselves or analyze each other, don't do it in the eyes of man versus man. Do it in us versus God, and we all drop the ball. Amen? And this is important to understand because no matter how good you think you are or how good I may think I am, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's a tough pill to swallow. And that, when I got saved, that's the pill I had to swallow in order to get saved to begin with. I thought I was a pretty good dude. I was raised in a religious, strict religious environment. Went to church every Sunday. Oh, look at me. I mean, those portable hands were working. I was patting myself on the back thinking I was pretty good. I'm, I'm bound to get to heaven. I got more than a 50-50 chance. I had no idea that I was hopelessly lost. So based on these scriptures, let's go through what the Bible says. Number one, it's an honest question. Sure it is. People ask it all the time. I think I'm good enough. I haven't beat my wife last week. I haven't done this, I haven't stolen anything, I haven't, and they'll go through this list of requirements. But here's what the Bible says, Job 9.2. Truly, I know it is so, but how can a man be righteous, and here's the word, before God, not before man. Notice what Job said here. He said, none of us can be righteous before God. And Job 14.4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. No one. And then in Job 25 verse 4. How then can a man be righteous before God? How can he be pure who is born of a woman? Now that last part of that verse really hits home. We were born in sin. As we're going to see in some verses following. We were born with a sin nature. No matter how good you are, or how many good you think you are, see, millions of people are depending on their goodness, their self-righteousness to get into heaven. And they're not going to make it. The only reason why you're going to heaven, and the only reason why I'm going to heaven, is by the total grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, as never before, we have churches sprouting up everywhere, preaching, modernism, liberal, all, everyone's going to heaven. We're basically good, and on and on. Folks, that is the most best weapon that Satan uses today. How good we are. How do we equate ourselves? And yet the Bible says we are as nothing until God receives us into his family. Next, let's give the biblical answer. Now in Proverbs 29, it said, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin? The answer is no. I can't cure it, but God can, and he cleansed it with his precious blood. The biblical answer, Ecclesiastes 7.20. Let's take the tough pill to swallow. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Not one, notice. Didn't say a few. Then say five or ten, none of us are, what does it say? Does not sin. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all, didn't say some, all we are like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God came down to save, let me say it clearly, folks, to save the unsavable. How many of you have become pure of sin since you've been saved? How many of you have, caught, have sin in your heart or your mind at times? 
How many of you have a lack of forgiveness, which is required in times? How many of us have had a lack of judgment, a lapse in judgment at times? How many of you have obeyed the commandments perfectly at times? The answer, you ever go to the doctor? I went to the doctor to get a cortisone shot in my arm for tenderitis. And I had to fill up this sheet. Have you taken drugs? Have you had bad cow disease? Have you had this? Have you had that? And there's less, and it's always the same dumb list. Have you ever fill out those forms and they're like triplets? You gotta fill them out two or three, the same question, the same answer. That's why I hate, I, that's why I bring my wife with me so she can fill out the paperwork. <laughs> well, it's the same with God. We fill out this checklist and we lie. We try to be, pretend to be somebody we're not. And yet in our deep inner thoughts, we prove that we're not savable. Let's go on. What does the Bible say in Isaiah 64, 6? I quoted it. Let's read it in depth. But we are all like an unclean thing. And our righteousness are like filthy rags. Whoa. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Whew. Kind of hits home, doesn't it? And yet he's talking to all. Notice all in all these verses. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. So if you think you're good enough to get to heaven, you're going in the wrong direction, my friend. The only way... I stand here today before you preaching this gospel is only totally by the grace of God. And even then, I make a lot of mistakes. Just talk it up among yourselves. And I make a lot of bloopers. And I've dropped the ball a lot of times. Say a lot of things I didn't mean. Think a lot of thoughts I shouldn't th uh, have thought about. And I blow it. Why? Because every day, I need His grace. Amen. Every day, you need. How many of you ever said things you regretted saying? Yes. How many of you have hurt people with the words that you say or the actions that you take? Every hand should go up. That's because we have a sinful nature. This is why we need a forgiving nature. Because sooner or later, I'm going to let you down. Here's the news flash. Sooner or later, we all are going to let each other down. Sooner or later, we're going to say things about each other that we regret saying. Amen? That's why we need to be saved to begin with. Amen? Amen. Let's go on. By our own evaluation, all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, Proverbs 16, 2. In our own eyes, hey, I'm okay. Sure, I make mistakes. No biggie, but somebody. But our always words that follow is this. Yeah, I've made some mistakes. I said some things I shouldn't have said, but so do you. Right? Come on. How many of you, in defending yourself, have attacked the person you're addressing? Oh, yeah, I made a mistake. However, so do you. Is that not sin? One thing Jesus did, he didn't go around. They accused him of everything. Paul, all the way down, and he found fault. And, but our old nature has a tendency to fight back. And you say, I would never do that. Wait till it happens. Because we get our feathers ruffled, don't we? We get offended. We don't like the thought of, uh-oh, I blew it. Instead of saying, I'm wrong, I confess. We say, yeah, but you've done things too. I mean, we're like little children, are we not? And yet all the other time, we're good. We're good. I'm, I'm still a good person. But we still fall into sin, do we not? And Christians have a difficult time. It's easy to say, well, that brother sins, or this sister sins, or this person sins, or that. But have you ever just said, I blew it? Not to God, but to each other? 
Try that sometime. Not as easy because you're seeing the person face to face. And yet we say, because basically what you're doing, you're saying, I'm a good person. And the Bible says, what? Let's go to the next verse. It says this, Proverbs 21, 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the hearts. Every time I've done this many times too. Now, wait a minute. I know I did something bad, but I know something you did worse. Aren't we like kids in a kindergarten in a sandbox? Well, I did worse. Look at that. I mean, I don't understand. Look at that guy down there. Oh, I better point to an open chair here. And we, we're, it's so easy to re deflect, right? Let's blame this person. I'm a good person. I think I'm a good person. And yet what does the Bible say in Proverbs 30, verse 12? There is a generation that is pure in his own eyes, yet is not washed from his... Ooh, we like the first part. Now the second part. Yet is not washed from his filthiness. Nobody likes looking. How many of you get up in the morning and look at all the failures, mistakes, sins that you've committed? <laughs> right? No. We're, but we have no problem pointing to people and all the mistakes I've committed. Or they've committed. It's easy to say they offended me. They sinned. Not realizing that we all have sin. Amen? Pretty quiet in here. I must be hitting some sensitive hearts. Because it's easy. We, it's easy. Our natural reflex, when somebody says, you offended me, you cussed me out, you did something, you said a nasty thing, or you did this, or you offended me, or you didn't shake my hand one day. I had this one pastor tell a story that where a couple of, if he didn't shake the hand, it was like, they got offended. And finally, the pastor just kept sticking. He kept his hand out the whole time. And so the congregation went. They let, it was comical. I said, I solved the problem. I had my hand out the whole time. Every single person who walked by shook my hand. And ironically, a couple of them that didn't shake my hand were the ones that were complaining. And finally, they said, well, your arm always out because I don't want to offend anybody. And yet... Oh, look what that Jim Partridge did. Oh, he didn't smile this way. He didn't smile this month. I'll take it back. He smiled at Dave. I want you to all uh, applaud him. He uh, smiled at Dave. And Dave had to pick him up off the floor. But see, we're always easy to do that. Why? Because we're all sinners. And once we grasp that, once we understand that, we don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve salvation. We don't even deserve to be here today. But still God loves us. Still God forgives us. And still God says, continue on. Amen? Amen. Or we learn by, do we do it by man's evaluation or God's evaluation? Now here is where the tire hits the road. Psalms 130, verse 3. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? None of us. None of us. Psalms 143, verse 2. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, O Lord, for in your sight no one living is righteous. So is being good good enough? The answer is no. The Bible says in Romans 10, 3, now listen, this is what the Pharisees' problem was. And sadly, today, this is what many Christians' problem are. And this is where you get what I call legalistic or judgmental Christians. They forget that we're all sinners. They forget they did not deserve heaven. I did not deserve heaven. They forget Jesus' loving kindness. See, once you accept that, you will be more forgiving, more compassionate, more Christ-like. Listen to what the Bible continues. Romans 10.3, a very important verse. Memorize it. 
For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, that means his holiness, his forgiveness, his justification, his redemption, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And what is that? I am a sinner. I blew it yesterday. I blew it today. And here's a news flash. I'm going to blow it tomorrow. And when you understand that, then we will also have the compassion that Jesus had, had the compassion that Paul had, had the compassion that Peter had. We will have the compassion that we're supposed to have, but we never exhibit it. Isn't that amazing? The people who are supposed to exhibit it the most ex don't exhibit it at all. I've been in some churches where they're the most unforgiving people. I said, what am I doing here? Why am I in this church? Why am I in this building? Why am I a bunch of bunch of legalist, judgmental people who's always looking down on you or can't do that? I've been in churches like that, and this is why for years I said, no, I don't want none of that. I get that out there. Why I would have want to come in here? And here's the reason. Because I was evaluating them with me. I evaluate on man. God says, no. Your evaluation comes from God. And as we are saw in those verses, we don't measure up. Listen to Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Did you get that? We're all Guilty. We're all sinners. So should we understand when our fellow brothers sin against us? Should we understand when our brother, uh, sister sins against us? Should we understand and show a little forgiveness? Shall we understand that love has to come from a new creation, a new heart? Most of the time. We don't, especially if it affects us personally. Galatians 3.22, But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. If I were to ask you now, do you believe in Jesus Christ? You'd say amen. If I ask you now, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You would say amen. If I ask you, do you love and forgive and live like Jesus Christ? We'd have the silence I got right now. In the time we understand that we're all sinners, no matter how good you may think you are, we're never good enough to get to heaven. In Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By his mercy. He saved us through the washing of regeneration. That's the new verb, John 3, 3. You must be born again. And renewing of the Holy Spirit. Until you have the Holy Spirit, we're never good enough. Can we be good in man's standards? Of course. Can we be holy and good in God's standards? There's only one way. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is the shed blood. His remedy is faith. His remedy is justification. His red, uh, remedy is redemption. That's what he did for us. Amen? Let's go on. Or by God's holy righteousness. Romans 4, 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now what is faith? Faith is saying... I have faith that this Bible says I'm a sinner. I don't like it. It stings my ear. It even offends me. But by faith, I have to accept I'm a lost sheep, a lost sinner. But it also says, by faith, God has a cure. His righteousness, His goodness, not our perfection. I hear people say, I haven't sinned in a year. I said, you must be in heaven already because I sure couldn't measure up to that one. But I hear Christians say this all the time. I'm a good person. I said, 
You got it all backwards, folks. The only reason why you're good is because you have the goodness of God in you. Let me say that for those that are dull of hearing. Only way you are good, only way you are declared righteousness is because God is in you. It's called the new nature. Does it mean we're never going to sin again? I wish that were the case. But see, God's always there saying, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Man is always saying, you have offended me, but I won't forget. I won't forget. I forgive you. I forgive you until next time. God doesn't say until next time. He just says, I forgive. Isn't that great? Let's go on. Romans 5, 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life. Get this. Through, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did you get that? Every time you try to live a religious life, you're going to fail. Every time you go by commandments and rules and regulations, you're going to fail. Every time you live through the power of Jesus Christ, you've already succeeded. Isn't that great? Let's go on. Romans 10.10. 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It doesn't mean just intellectual belief. Oh, I believe that. I believe in Detroit. I know some people who believe all the doctrines from it, but they never ask him in. So they're on the outside when they're supposed to be on the inside. Last. If you want to fight what I just said or debate what I just said, God's word is final. I never give my opinions. They're not worth anything. Trust me. Listen to God's word is final. Psalms 51 verse 5. David, after he had committed the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Adultery, mind you. Look what he said. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. We were born in sin. Whether you think it's fair, doesn't matter. Whether you think it's unfair, doesn't matter. The Word of God makes it clear. God's Word is final. In Psalms 58, verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. There's a verse I always hear from the mothers. The terrible twos. Those saintly little innocent children that sneak into the cookie jar and get in more trouble than Carter has liver pills. Now why do you think that is? If they were pure of sin, why is that inner ability inside to naturally rebel? And before you start saying, Oh, you mean nasty kids. You were a kid once. Remember that? I remember my parents, most parents say, I'll pick on Greg. You don't mind me picking on you, Greg. He said that kind of quietly. I better not. <laughs> most parents say to their kids, what are you going to be when you grow up? My parents would say, what are you going to be if I let you grow up? <laughs> I had that rebellious nature. So if God can change a person like me, surely he can change a person like you. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, I present it again. Is being good good enough? The answer is no. Depend on God's grace? Right answer. Depend on his mercy? Right answer, and you cannot lose. Beware of any other path that leads to destruction. Self-righteousness will never get you in. Running around saying, I'm a real good person, you just got off the track. Last verse, Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but its end is the ways of death. Amen. 
and amen. Let's stand.